night, children, you are dismissed for Children's Church. Well, if you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2, we're actually going to cover the ending of Mark 2 uh, and the beginning part of Mark chapter 3 today. We'll read that here in just a moment. But we're continuing this series that we've been on. Can you believe this is the, maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask that question because you might be like, oh yeah, we can believe it, Pastor. But can you believe this is the ninth message in this series? It doesn't, to me, it doesn't feel like we've been preaching on it for very long. I mean, we're getting through it though. We're coming up on the third chapter here. But it's exciting. And in the last few sermons, if you remember that I've preached on this, we've seen this, um, this I, let me just say it this way. Today is going to be a big transition in Jesus' ministry. We're going to see some things that really change the course and direction of, of what was happening. And in this sermon, we're really going to, these past few sermons and this one, we've really seen this opposition to Jesus growing from these Jewish religious leaders that want nothing more but to trap Jesus. And we see that today. We even see a plotting to do that. And particularly, I'm talking about this group known as the Pharisees. And all of it comes to a head today in today's passage And we're going to look at two conflicts here between Jesus and the Pharisees. And it's interesting because both of them have to do with the Sabbath day. And that's why today's message, if we go to the next slide, is titled, The Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen? All right, so let's read our passage this morning in in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23. And we'll read through chapter 3, verse 6. It says, one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence? which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to to destroy him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And as we cover two uh, sections here, Lord, may we hear the message that you have for us today. May we receive the grace and reject the legalism, Father, that we're going to talk about today. And we're just so grateful of the way that you are always in teaching mode to let us know how we are to respond and live in situations like this. Father, we thank you so much for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things I don't like about life is rules. How about you? Do you like rules? I hate rules. I don't, anyone like rules? Raise your hand. Now, okay, I was going to get there. Now, I'm a, I'm a habitual rule follower. Like, I hate not following the rules. It just doesn't mean that I have a good relationship with the rules. Does that make sense? It's kind of both sides of the coin there, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too, even though we try. But life is full of, of rules and laws, unfortunately, there's no getting around that church. We have tax laws, and we know that time of the season's here, right? We have tax laws, we have property laws, we have traffic laws, we have laws relating to marriage and family. Schools have their codes of conduct, their dress codes, and every major corporation has pages upon pages of policy. Even our church has what we call bylaws. We have policies that help guide and govern our church, how we respond, how we act, how we make choices and decisions for the betterment of the church and the kingdom. Okay, but we got to understand that God, when he created us human beings, he also gave us laws and commands that we should learn and follow 
and obey. And I know everyone always, there's a lot of people that look at this thing as a, as a book of, of do's and don'ts, but it's so much greater than that. And I hope by the end of today's message, you will come into agreement with that statement. But we need to be careful that we don't become like these Pharisees and twist his law, his word, into things that were never meant to be. For example, have you ever heard someone say, it's in the Bible, right? And you're like, I'm not so sure if that's in the Bible, you know what I mean? A lot of times I have fun with people because they'll tell me, well, this is so, it's in the Bible, and then I just say, okay, I mean, then I hand them my Bible, and I say, well, you show me, and we'll have a conversation about it, and they're like, oh, well, I don't know where it's at, and I usually say, oh, <laughs> it must have been in, in First Hezekiah or Methodicus or something, you know, I make up some name that's not even in the Bible, and they're like, yeah, I think so, and then that tells me all I need to know, <laughs> right? But in this passage today, um, we're going to discover some of this with Mark's help. And today's passage teaches us three very important truths that we need to know about God's law. If you have your bulletins with you, and the first one is this. It's important to understand that God's laws are made for our benefit. Well, I don't like that law. Well, I'm sorry. It was for your benefit, right? Uh, we have rules in our homes for our children, right? Our children may not like those rules. Tony, Zeb, do you like every rule you have at home? Yeah, I didn't think I needed to ask, even ask that, right? But listen, believe it or not, those are made for your benefit. Sometimes for our enjoyment, but mainly for your benefit, right? But right off the bat in verses 23 and 24, uh, we see these Pharisees, and they accuse Jesus' disciples of doing something super bad. Let's, we're going to reread these but in sections okay so let's reread that so it's fresh verses 23 and 24 it says one sabbath he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way his disciples began to pluck some heads of grain and the pharisees were saying to him look why are they doing what is not lawful on the sabbath so let me give you a picture of this that'd be about me like me driving out to the to the roof and halvey farms and, and and getting some getting some corn right picking some corn just i'm walking along and i grab a piece of corn and they come out and you know shoot me for taking their corn no i'm just kidding but they're like what are you doing eating my corn right well that's kind of what um is going on here there's a difference in just plucking something for the road versus filling a truck full of it right and we'll get to that but it's important to understand why these pharisees are upset you would think that they'd be upset because they would consider this stealing, but, but that's not it, right? You see, they had set up all these, God had done this. God had set up these property laws in Israel that are so different than our property laws today. And what it says is that it's okay to eat out of your neighbor's garden as long as you didn't put any of it in a basket or put a sickle to anything like cutting it down harvesting it so like if you were walking around and you were hungry it would be okay absolutely totally acceptable under law back then to walk up and grab a few grapes or to grab a kernel of wheat just to help feed yourself if you're hungry along the way and I know some of you are thinking absolutely not right because our minds have been changed today right but the disciples we need to understand they're not doing anything wrong they're just simply plucking grain from a person's field. But anyways, here's what the Pharisees were upset about. It wasn't even that act. They're upset about the day in which they chose to do this. They're upset that it's on the Sabbath day, right? Because observing the Sabbath in the Jewish culture was super, super important in this time. It's still important today, but it was super important then. And it was especially important to the Pharisees who prided themselves on keeping the law down to the very last letter. That's what the Pharisees were so upset about. They spent most of their time not loving people, not evangelizing, trying to convert people into the faith. They spent most of their time making sure each and every person followed every single law down to the detail. That would be extremely annoying, wouldn't it? We have to remember whose idea the Sabbath was. Whose idea was it? It was God's idea, right? But the rabbis of Jesus' time, friends, they had all sorts of rules and regulations that they added to those that were in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, they listed about 39 main types of work that were forbidden on the Sabbath day. I don't know if I could remember five rules, let alone 39 rules, right? And they would organize those into six subcategories, and we're going to preach on each one this morning. No, I'm just kidding. Number three on the list was this. No reaping. You could not reap harvest, right? You could not reap on Sabbath day. No reaping. And, you know, they had some biblical basis for it. Exodus 34, 21 says, Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And so when we look at this passage back then, 
It would have been, yes, it would have been unlawful, sorry Jerry, it would have been unlawful for a farmer <laughs> to leave the synagogue, <laughs> leave church, right, and go out and start harvesting his field. It would have been illegal, not just unlawful, I mean it would have been illegal for them to do this in this time. They would have been breaking God's law, but what the disciples were doing, it would take quite a bit of a stretch to say what they were doing was reaping, right? And so what was it? If they weren't reaping, what was it? Well, they were hungry. All they were doing was getting something to eat. It was that simple. And I love what Jesus does here. Jesus doesn't get into a debate with the Pharisees about whether the disciples were doing something right or wrong. No, instead, Jesus gives them three statements, right, in response. And the first one is this. He reminds them, it's in your bulletins, that David and his friends ate the consecrated bread. This is a pretty fascinating story He was giving them an example from the Old Testament of something that was clearly unlawful. If we look at verses 25 and 26, this is what Jesus says. It says, and he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest. What an awesome name, right? And ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Okay. So do you, do you notice what Jesus did here? It's very interesting. He made this statement. He said to the, these Pharisees, have you never read? Why do you think that's so ironic? It had to sting because remember, these are people who thought they knew it all. They had studied from the time they were young. They would have known it all by the time they were 12. They would have been out of school and ready to judge people. I mean, ready to hold people accountable, right? No. You know, it would have been such a bad thing at the time. And so Jesus takes them right back to the very scriptures they're supposed to be experts in. And so that would have been kind of an insult. You know, he's like, haven't you ever read? Like, don't you know this stuff? I thought you knew it. I thought you were the experts. He doesn't say it that way. That's probably how I would have said it in my humanness. But he gives them this amazing example of David and the consecrated bread. And I want to give you just a little bit of background to the story. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 21 if you want to read it. But this incident took place before David was king. See, if David was king, he could have just done whatever he wanted, right? People wouldn't have said too much. But this is before he was the king. And when he was still on the run from his life from King Saul, who was trying to kill him, and David and his men were hungry. So they go into this tabernacle. They requested bread for him and his men. But unfortunately, they didn't have what is called ordinary bread. Right. If you weren't the priest, we read in Scripture, uh, you're not. Or, you're just ordinary. If you're not the priest, and so they were all out of ordinary bread. But the problem was, there was lots of bread there. As a matter of fact, it says that they ate the bread. Did you hear what they called it? Of the presence. Now, why that's significant is because every Sabbath day, a priest would bake two, uh, twelve loaves of bread, and he would lay them out in two six rows on a table of pure gold before the Lord on the sanctuary. Everything back then was really ceremonial. We got to understand that. And at the end of each week, that bread would have been removed and replaced with new ones, and it could only have been eaten by the priest and actually his sons in a holy place. And so here's where it gets interesting. Although it was not technically lawful what David did for him and his friends, for them to eat the bread because they were hungry and need, Jesus is saying it was okay. It's phenomenal. See, there's this big law. You can't do this. You can't do that. And Jesus is like, listen, it's okay. And it goes back to our main point that we're talking about is that God's laws are made for our benefit. God doesn't just give us these laws to make us miserable or to take away the enjoyment of our life. On the contrary, they're designed for our good. And so even if what the disciples were doing was breaking the Sabbath, which it wasn't, Jesus is saying that human need trumps ceremonial law. Why? Because God's laws were made for our benefit. And secondly, Jesus goes on to apply this broader principle to the Sabbath day itself. Number two here, he says that the Sabbath was made for man. Verse 27, it said, and he said to them, the Sabbath Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You know, when we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, when God created man and woman on the sixth day, what did he do on the seventh day? 
He rested. Good job. Everyone gets an A plus and a star sticker if I had some. But it's important to note here, people came first. Right? God didn't make the Sabbath day and then create people to keep it. He didn't say, I'm going to create this Sabbath day of rest so I could trap people when they go out and do things. No. He created people first and then he made the Sabbath day to benefit people. What, what, well, how does that benefit us? Well, this is a day to rest from your work. It's a day for refreshing and enjoyment. It's a day to worship your God and creator who rested himself from all his work and set the example for us. Isaiah 58 tells us that we should call the Sabbath a delight, right? But unfortunately, the rabbis and all their extra rules and regulations had made the Sabbath day anything but a delight, it had become tiresome and restrictive and a, and a burden to bear rather than enjoyment, re- worship, and refreshment. And that's why the Pharisees accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath just for picking a few grains of wheat with their hands to eat along the way. And so we got to ask the question, what does the Sabbath day mean for us today? And here's where it's really good. Because God in his goodness, church, Listen, I've shared this concept before. Our world today says you should work yourself to death. And if I would would ask for a raise of hands of how many people are weary and tired from all their work, I bet there would be a lot of hands in this room. It's not just physically what you do to clock in and clock out of your job. It's everything you do. We are designed. God created this day for our benefit so we can worship and rest. God made the Sabbath for you, friends. God doesn't want you to work nonstop seven days a week without ever taking a break and getting burnt out and, and depressed and anxious and all these other things. And he doesn't want you to miss out on church. He doesn't want you to miss out on the corporate worship of the body of believers who are designed to help not only hold each other accountable, but to lift up and to edify and to encourage one another. And so he gave the Sabbath day so we could slow down, so we could rest from our work. And it's okay to rest. Don't buy into the lie that you got to work yourself to death. And he gave us this day so we could gather together and worship and pray. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And Jesus goes on in his third statement here to the Pharisees, which is the most powerful statement of of all, and where we get the title to the message today. Number three is that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Verse 28, he says this, he says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. It's interesting because the Pharisees were questioning Jesus' judgment and allowing his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. And here's what I love about this. If you really think about it, Jesus, he said himself, I'm the Son of Man. He is the Lord of all. How about this? Jesus is the one who gave the Sabbath command in the first place. I and the Father are one. We believe in the Holy Trinity. Amen. He who he was before time existed. In, uh, you cannot put God and Jesus in the realm of time. They just always have been. And as with all his laws, I'm going to say it again. God gave us a Sabbath for our good, for our benefit. And he has the authority to tell us how to observe it, and he has. So that's the first truth. The second point to today is interesting, is that it's always lawful to do good. Can you think of a time that it's not okay to do good? Like, oh, I I shouldn't do this right now because it's awkward, there's too many people here. That's usually what our excuse is, right? I don't want to, I don't want to, I feel the Holy Spirit telling me to help this homeless man on the corner here, but man, I would have to change lanes, park, maybe get honked at, I I just, it's too much trouble, I don't, I don't want to do good right now. I know that's not what you're saying, You, you leave that part out, but it's always lawful to do Good. I'm holding up traffic. You're, you could get a ticket for that. No, it's always lawful to do good. And we see this in the next section. Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees over this man with a shriveled hand. Let's look at the first two verses of chapter 3 again. It says, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. 
And I love this. Mark sets up the scene so well here, church. If you could imagine this with me in your heads, it's, it's the Sabbath day. Jesus goes to church, right? He goes into the synagogue. There's a man there with a shriveled hand who needs healing, and Jesus has all authority and power on earth to bring and provide this healing. And all of a sudden, these Pharisees are like, all right. <laughs> they're watching. They're, try- they're waiting. They're looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. And now, if we remember, Jesus has already done this on Sabbath day, right? Remember, earlier we preached about how he cast out a demon in the synagogue on Sabbath before. And so they're probably thinking, oh, is he going to do it again? Because if he does this one more time, we got him. He's breaking the Sabbath. He's, he's breaking these laws, and we're going to get him. And church, that's wrong on so many levels. We can understand that this morning, right? What do you do when you come to church? What are we supposed to do? Worship, amen. We're here to worship God, but the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus and said, you can't hear the message if your mind is on something else, amen. Listen, church, today, you can't hear the message God has for you if you're judging the person across the aisle for being here or for what they're wearing or what they're doing, can you? (laughs) Okay, I'm glad we agree with that, right? We're here to worship God, amen. Secondly, I love this, the Pharisees, oh, they're such good people. They want Jesus to heal this man, don't they? That's exciting. They're waiting and watching and hoping Jesus heals this man. But for all the wrong reasons, they could care less about this man. They could care less about his healing. They just want to trap Jesus and accuse Jesus. How insane is that? We don't do that stuff today, though, do we? Similarly, right? See, according to their self-made book of rules and regulations... They said you could only help or heal a person on the Sabbath if it was life-threatening, right? I could just imagine someone choking on their manna. (laughs) Wait, wait, is he going to spit it up? No, he's good. He's got it down. He's got a little bit of an airway there. It's okay. I'm not going to go help him. Could you imagine that? (sighs) I tell you what. Ah, he's faking it. (laughs) You know? There, There was a synagogue ruler in the Gospel of Luke. This is not a good thing, but listen to what he said. It says in, in Luke 13, 14, but the ruler of the synagogue, indignant, right, upset, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, listen to this, this is so pompous, it says, there are six days in which work ought to be done, come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Isn't that insane? Yes, this man's life was not in danger. And so they had determined that, man, it is so unlawful. Jesus is breaking the law, and we're going to get him. I love Jesus so much. Amen to you? I love that Jesus doesn't care about all these silly things. He sees this man with a shriveled hand who needs healing. But you know who else he sees? I just I love how Jesus handles things. He also sees those Pharisees over there with their judgmental eyes, with their accusing eyes, their accusational eyes. And he sees that they're trying to trap him in a violation of the law. What does Jesus do? He confronts them. He confronts them. Jesus was not a people pleaser as some people think. He just spoke the truth whether it pleased you or not. And so he confronts these Pharisees and their ungodly attitude. And I love what he does first. In verse 3, he has the man stand up in the midst of the room, right? He said, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. <laughs> It's funny to me that they didn't really even have to watch Jesus very closely, right? That's their intentions. But Jesus is like, I'm going to do all this stuff out in public. I'm not going to be shy about this. Jesus purposely planned to heal this man in front of everyone. And then he asked them a series of questions before he healed him. And he asked them this question. And he said to them in verse 4, and he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill but they were silent. They can't say anything, can they? I mean, what are you going to say in response to that? They're hoping to trap him, but Jesus is really trapping the Pharisees here with their questions, with these questions, isn't he? They can't say it's lawful to do evil on Sabbath because everyone knows evil is evil and it's wrong. And if they agree that it's lawful to do good, then they can't accuse Jesus of doing something wrong, right? You see the trap Jesus puts him in? So what do they say? They say what every cowardice people say. Nothing. (laughs) They just keep quiet. There's nothing they can say to justify their position. 
They know they're wrong, but instead of humbling themselves and confessing their sins, they harden their hearts and say nothing at all. Verse 5, let's look at it. It says, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Did you guys realize that Jesus gets angry? Oh, I mean, I'm serious. Like, I remember the first time I ever read that as a Christian, I'd be like, Jesus is sinless. He can't get angry. It's bad to get angry. (laughs) What? And that, I mean, I had an anger problem, so, like, I just thought it was just the wrong, wrongest thing to ever have. But Jesus was not just angry to be angry. It's not a sinful anger. This is a righteous anger directed towards sin. See, Jesus was so grieved and so moved by the stubbornness of the Pharisee's heart that they were willing, that they would rather him not heal this man and bring refreshment to his life so he could follow some rules that they made up, that they expounded on that God did. He was angry that they would consider their man-made regulations to be more important than this man's healing. And so Jesus chose to do good on the Sabbath, and he says to him, stretch out your hand, and he stretches it out, and he's completely restored. You see, it's always lawful to do good. I want to read this passage in Romans 13. It'll sound very familiar, I think. Verses 8 through 10, it says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, so all the commandments, right, are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. It's not against the law. In other words, the law is a means to an end, not an end all, right? The law is meant to give you guidance and to show us the uh, concrete ways that we can love one another and love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, all our mind, amen? That's what the law is for. This law isn't to, this book of, of the law is not to oppress you. It's not to oppress you. It's not to hold you down. It's not to tell you what you can and can't do. It's to help guide us through this life. It's to help us to be holy and to live holy lives that are pleasing to God in his sight so that when we stand before him at our time, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We don't hear, away from me, I never knew you, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. Amen, church? That's what the law is for. It's to help us through this life. Between the law and the Holy Spirit, we have everything we need because God has spoken and God has delivered and God has provided. Amen? This is not meant to be technicalities and roadblocks to prevent you from loving one another. And so when you have the opportunity to do good for someone or to do something good, You don't have to stop and ask yourself, hmm, is this lawful? (laughs) Is this allowed? Is this good? There's too many people in this room. I don't want to interrupt to do something good. No, all the commandments are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so it's always lawful to do good. Finally, we come to the final point, which is where I really want to camp out and spend some time, but it's not going to be a lot of time. But we come to this important truth about God's law, and it's number three here, is that legalism is the enemy of grace. You see, early in my faith, um, my wife and I, I think we fell victim to legalism. We were so gung-ho and so excited for the grace of God in our life that we began to, to almost be like Pharisees. We began to view people through our maturity that we had gained, which wasn't very mature, and we thought that people who were just coming to Christ should be exactly where we were. We didn't understand that people are coming to Christ and it takes time. Transformation is not instantaneous. There's parts of it, but it takes time. The Holy Spirit needs to speak and reveal to people's hearts so they can grow closer to Him. If salvation made you perfect, perfect, it would be no need for you to still be on this earth. He should just take you with him right there in that spot. Amen? That's the difference. Legalism, church, is the enemy of grace. Verse 6 says, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him 
how to destroy him. Do you see this, church, how their legalism, how they're trying to get Jesus to follow every letter of the law led to them wanting to kill Jesus, wanting to end his life? That'd be about like me saying, hey, some of us in this room aren't living the most holiest of lives. Let's plot to kill you. (laughs) That would not go very well, right? Because I would be on the list too because I'm not perfect. No one is. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. But the free gift of God is grace. Amen. Amen. It's salvation. It's eternal. Okay. We've seen all this hostility towards Jesus building up over these last two chapters, church. And now it's coming to a head. That's a pretty serious jump, right? To watching and waiting till we got to go put a committee together to figure this out. How might we destroy this man? How might we kill him? The Pharisees were ready to do it because of his actions and his teachings. And it's so interesting to me that verse 6 says that they teamed up with the Herodians. And I want to tell you why that that's significant. We don't know a whole lot about the Herodians in the Bible. What they are, they're followers of King Herod. We do know that King Herod was an awful, awful man, right? Um, So they were supporters of him. I don't think it was a full-blown political party or anything. But here's the catch about Herodians and about King Herod. They hated everything that stood for him. The Pharisees did, right? So hear this out. They hate Jesus for everything he's doing, but they also hate these Herodians, but they're willing to team up with them. What's that old saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? That's kind of what's going on here. And so the Herodians, they knew that King Herod had some pull with the political power in Rome, and so they were going to try to use that power and that influence to help trap Jesus, because nothing happened during this time without the approval of Caesar, of Rome, of Pilate, right? We know the story. And together, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they began to plot how they might kill Jesus. Why? Well, let's look at everything we've learned so far in Mark. Jesus was teaching in their synagogues with what? Authority that amazed everybody. Remember, he was casting out demons, and it it amazed everyone. They said they've never seen teachings like this. We were astonished. Well, then we also see that he was claiming to have the authority to forgive sins, and they say only God has authority to forgive sins. Yeah, take a hint. Jesus is God. Amen? (laughs) He was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Oh, man, how dare he eat with scum, right? Remember that word was in the Bible, right? He did, his disciples did not fast. They're just listing off these big things. And now, and now he's healing on the Sabbath. Oh, that's it. That's where we draw the line. He's got to go. <laughs> Church, Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. And the Pharisees hated him for it. I don't understand it. But what I do understand is that legalism is the enemy of grace. Legalism squashes grace every time. Where we ought to be a people of grace, and we're going to talk about that, we often are a people of accusation and a people of judgment instead of a people of grace and forgiveness. Legalism wants to dictate you and to control you, dictate how you live your life, dictate how you live this Christian life, and to control you. But God's not like that. He gives you freedom and grace. He doesn't want you to be robotic in your Christianity, and your faith. He wants you to be you, and he wants you to chase after him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's why he gave us free will and freedom to choose. God offers you the forgiveness of sins through his son, Jesus. Amen? He doesn't just force it upon you. And he offers you the freedom to live a life of loving God and loving your neighbor through the power of the Holy Spirit. And don't mistake what I'm talking about, that freedom just means we can go do whatever we want. He's showed us and called us and commanded us how we are to live this life. But we have freedom in how we do it. As a church, we must always, always, always reject legalism and choose grace. Amen? Always. There's going to be people that are going to walk through our doors that are going to be hurting and that don't know how to respond to the Christian faith and message. But we do. Or we know how we ought to. And we ought not to be Pharisees about it. We're going to, be, we're going to see people over the course of our time come into our church that <laughs> don't have it all put together. Who in here does, right? We need to love them the way Jesus would love them. Give them grace. But at the same time, there's lines to be drawn. And I'm not saying that there's not. 
But we ain't going to get anywhere without the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't have got anywhere, and they're not going to get anywhere. And when you separate love from the law, what do you get? Legalism. They can't work together. One's the enemy of the other, and that's what the Pharisees did, and that's why Jesus was angry with them. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. Uh, I want to close and give you three quick thoughts here, and you can fill these out. It's in your bulletins. But three quick thoughts this morning on how to learn to love the law of God. Learn to love his word. And here's the first thing. You have to think good thoughts of God, right? Oftentimes we think God caused this, God did that, God, why is God doing this to me? We need to eradicate those thoughts from our mind, right? Some people think that God made all these laws and commands just to weigh us down and to make us miserable and nothing could be further from the truth. God's laws are made for your benefit, for our benefit. And when we follow in God's way, (laughs) our life will be better and sweeter, not bitter and worse. Secondly is this. We need to receive the Sabbath as a gift from God. Uh, I know it's normal for us in 2024 to to just write this off. And I'm not saying it's going to be like it was in the 70s and 80s where you don't even go out to eat. I'm not saying that stuff. That's legalism, right? That's legalism. But the important thing is that you are finding time to rest. That you are committing your life to worshiping your God. Amen? Because that's what he set it up for. We shouldn't think of the Sabbath as a, as a burden or an imposition or some type of interruption in our week. But rather we should look forward to this day that has been set apart for us by God. Because he said, they're going to need it. <laughs> they're going to need it. We should call the Sabbath a delight like Isaiah says in Isaiah 58. And we should also call, he also goes on to say that the Lord's day is honorable. And number three is my message to you this morning, church. And I'm going to read some passages fastly, but I'm not going to give you the references till the end. It says, the third thing I want you to know is that we should be a people of grace. We should love God, love our family, and love our neighbor. We should share with God's people who are in need And practice hospitality. We should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We should be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love. Which binds them all together in perfect unity. Romans 12, 13. 2 Peter 3, 18. Ephesians 4, 32. And Colossians 3, 14. And I could add and add and add to it all the instructions that we have to choose grace over legalism. Because our God is a God of grace. Amen. And so let us be a people of grace. Let's worship. Can we stand and worship this last song together?